All right, hello everybody. My name is John Kohler. I'm a principal architect in Nutanix, and I'm going to talk about uh, optimizing KVM performance for electronic health record systems. Although the talk really isn't uh, health record system specific, so a lot of the uh, methodologies and uh, items we'll be talking about are, are valid for everybody. Um, so, quick agenda. I'm going to talk about kind of what EHR systems are, real quick, just for context setting, so um, everybody gets the the acronym, and then dive into uh, a technical example. Um, this is a technical conference. This is going to be a highly technical talk, um, and uh, I'll try to space it out uh, enough um, where possible. Um, so this uh, practical example will focus on core KVM, and then we've also uh, got some related ecosystem enhancements that we'll be talking about as well. Um, so what's an EHR system? EHR stands for electronic health record. If you've ever been to a doctor, um, and seeing them type up your record digitally. Um, they're probably running a system like the ones on the left here. Um, from the IT infrastructure side, there's a few things to know. Um, one is that the ISV, which is the software vendor, um, mandates the application architecture. So you know, as, as good of an architect as uh, any of us might be, um, it, you know, kind of, it flows downhill, right? So they'll tell you what it needs to be and what the core system's behavior is gonna be. A couple key tenets here is that the provisioning and scalability of these systems are inelastic. Um, they rarely get smaller, and they live on forever, right? So uh, mistakes uh, tend to have a long half-life. Um, and the other thing, just to kind of set your mind in the right place, is that you know, people touch this 24-7, right? Uh, and some of these use cases are life critical. Um, so it goes without saying that tolerance for the system is running slow or the wheel is spinning is, is pretty much zero. Um, and in that kind of clinical setting, uh, sometimes you just can't come back to the computer later when the system comes back up and, and so on. So um, when you translate that all down to the infrastructure level, it just means you gotta uh, really pay attention to the details. So uh, you know, the moniker here is really it takes a village. So when we're talking about optimizing performance for these platforms on top of KVM. Um, we have to look at both KVM as well as all the other pro, uh, um, components that plug into KVM. Um, and from the Nutanix perspective, you know, we're just going to be focusing on uh, our hypervisor, which is powered by KVM. So, practical example. Uh, so, uh, huh. uh, maybe six months ago or so, I got a report from one of our EHR uh, partners that um, one of the benchmarks they're running on top of our platform was slower than another platform. Uh, and so typical A-B testing, hardware's the same, processor's the same, it's just not as quick on our platform. Uh, and these are the types of things that we do with those vendors to make sure that we figure this stuff out um, at an engineering level before customers come and, and yell at us. Um, and the benchmark that we're gonna be talking about here is a pretty typical load runner type benchmark where you have uh, some system, this happens to be running on Windows, um, and it loads up synthetic users, does some work with the application, and um, measures the response time as it, as it ramps up. Um, so from the kind of core systems perspective, uh, there's a lot of different ways to uh, measure what's going on under the covers. I personally am very visual. I love flame graphs um, and, uh, and using Linux Perf. Uh, if anybody in the audience or online is new to flame graphs, I have a copy paste example on how to generate this exact type of graph in the appendix it's dead simple, um, so you can get it from, from the slide deck. Um, so the simple question, which is rhetorical, is what's wrong with this picture, All right? Uh, there are four key things wrong with this picture. Um, one is that the uh, <coughs> stack that um, uh, shows off the uh, IPI delivery path uh, call chain is not taking any fast paths, meaning you can see it is actually occurring outside of the VCP run loop. Um, which is uh, not great. Um, and we can uh, kind of infer that any sort of slowness that we're gonna talk about in the next couple points is, is kind of uh, getting incurred on that path as well, meaning IPI delivery is slower than it should be. Um, the second piece is when you're looking at a flame graph, anytime you see this wide um, kind of swath of a tabletop right here um, should set your alarm bells off because that means that that function itself is spending a lot of time doing either um, code inside that function or inline functions um, that is just taking up time, right? Uh, and not time spent actually going through the rest of the call chain. Um, so each pass through VCPU run is expensive, which is not expected. Um, 
you can't see the name in here. If you actually go to the raw flame graph, you'd be able to click and highlight and, and, and look at this. But there's also about 1% of this graph, 1% um, of all samples done in this um, trace are due to uh, XSAVE guest uh, and host load, which is odd. Um, and the last one is this absolutely hilariously large flat top for speculation control. It's just ridiculous. So we're going to get into to where that comes from and how we can whack that. So. Um, so let's dive in uh, a little bit. I'll just kind of build this out. Um, so for the first issue, um, this is, again, remember this benchmark is running on Windows. So the IPI delivery path is different for Windows than it is for Linux. Um, uh, without going into the details, uh, you can go and see many, many talks by Vitaly, who's talked about um, Windows Enlightenments and so on. One of the Windows Enlightenments for emulating Hyper-V on top of KVM is called uh, SYN-IC, or Synthetic Interrupt Controller. And the default um, for that enables something called Auto End of Interrupt Pair Virtualization, which is a mouthful, and it disables hardware acceleration like Intel APIC-V. Um, and that's, that's what we had configured here. Right? It works all right. It's better than not having it enabled. Um, but it's still less than ideal. ideal. Um, in 5.15, um, there was uh, some support added for um, a uh, enlightenment called HV-APIC-V, which enables hardware acceleration. However, um, for small Windows guests under 240 CPUs, um, the exit reason is actually APIC write instead of MSR write. Um, so they don't use the X2 APIC ASR, um, MSRs. So they don't actually have a fast path. That means that anytime an IPI is issued, even though the um, APIC IPIs are trap-like, it has to go all the way out of the run loop, then go through the handler, um, uh, leading to further delays. So the fix here for this specific benchmark is to switch over to hardware accelerated um, IPIs in Windows. And uh, also we've introduced a new APIC uh, fast path handler, which I have the code for in the appendix. I gotta send upstream, but it's, it's incredibly simple. It just looks at the exit reason and, and handles it faster. Um, for the rest of these things, I'm actually gonna call out how many samples these are in the graph itself. Um, the IPI overhead isn't really um, a sample overhead from a, a flame graph perspective, it's just kind of coming out of the wrong place. The rest of these are actually just pure overheads. Um, so that VCP run overhead that we described uh, in the graph, which is kind of wide, uh, long table, is um, multifold. Uh, one, um, keep in mind this hardware is Ice Lake based hardware, which uh, from a mitigations perspective has enhanced IBRS. Um, which is a set it once and, and forget it type of um, configuration. Um, and long story short, uh, the way that, that enablement works in the kernel today, um, when, you, when the guest enables that, we disable um, MSR bitmap inter interception so that um, uh, every single time uh, the kernel exits, it has to ex issue an expensive read MSR on spec control because the guest may have changed it even though the guest will never change it. Um, there's also a regression here uh, in the um, debug CTL restore mechanism. Um, architecturally, debug CTL MSR is zeroed on VM exits. So if you had set it on entry, you have to restore it on exit to go back to the host. Um, it is uh, regressed in 5.17 and below uh, where it's setting it even though we at the host level didn't actually set it. So there's two fixes here. One is fixing the enablement and interception uh, path for EIBRS, and the second one is rever reverting the offending commit. And I've got the, the details for every single one of these, including commits and, and such in the, the appendix. But I'll keep it to a summary level for the sake of time, so we've got all other, a bunch of cool stuff to talk about. Um, the third bit is uh, the XSAVE overhead. Now this one's kind of interesting. It's a bit of a, a mystery and took us a, a minute to figure it out. So if you look at the assembly, which you can do with, um, or I should say disassembly, you can do with perf top. Uh, you can see here that um, the cost for this overhead is uh, exclusively limited to um, the entry and exit, doing an exit BV on the um, XA feature mask uh, every single time. And that's because at Nutanix, the con control plane that we have will automatically mask out MPX and PKU features from the guest, which conveniently are X saveable features. Um, which means that the host view of XSAVE and the guest view of XSAVE are different, therefore you gotta flip them back and forth constantly. Um, unfortunately, it's not just enough to just compile it out and go to a kernel config change. Um, so there's some 
early initialization code we gotta mess with to get this to work properly so that the host mask will actually match our guest mask uh, because we can't go change the auto masking feature because we're just, we're not going to mask in MPX or PKU to our guests. We're just not gonna do it. So we gotta fix the um, early initialization code, um, which we've got a sample for. Um, and lastly, for that fix four, this is actually the easiest one of all, which gets me so giddy because the, the, the upside of this is so, so large. Um, that uh, essentially we also have a, a guest versus host mismatch here. Um, and the issue actually comes from, this is kind of a subtle nuance, right? The issue comes from the way that the mitigations are set up in 5.16 and below, um, and QMU 2.11 and higher. Um, QMU 2.11 and higher turns on set comp or a sandbox on whatever the flag is um, by default. And below kernel 516, any set comp jail will automatically get um, uh, over pessimized from a security perspective, from a mitigations perspective. So it ends up looking like, from the host perspective, that you have mitigations cranked all the way up. And even though guest might have, you know, ERBRS and, and whatever configured, there will always mismatch and you will always have to do a right MSR. The really devious thing here is that when you do a right MSR to spec control, completely stalls the CPU pipeline. Um, so it has to flush everything, flush all the speculative holds and everything, um, and it's really expensive. So thanks to our friends at Red Hat, they changed the default in 5.16 and above to de-pessimize seccomp jails, um, because really that was all kind of window dressing. Um, the commit message for that's really detailed and is, is in the appendix. Um, so into the kind of uh, the, the spoiler results here, um, we can see that after we've done some optimizations, the flame graph looks a lot better. All right, so we've got a much shorter little tabletop here in um, vCPU, um, vCPU run. We've got the call chain for handle APIC right coming, um, doing the IPI delivery in the vCPU run loop itself, which is great, which means the IPI delivery is happening faster. Um, and if we build this out a little bit, um, these changes were, uh, you know, as, as specified, we've switched over to hardware accelerated IPIs um, and added the new uh, fast path handler. Uh, and we've suppressed the um, expensive read MSRs on spec control and reverted a, a fending commit to make the tabletop for the vCPU run faster. Um, the X save overhead is still there. Um, it's just kind of a more nuanced fix. Uh, so, but when we get that done, we'll, we'll whack another 1% off of this as well. So we'll get some additional uh, headroom. And you can see here that after that backport, the overhead for spec control is completely gone, which is great. Um, on the actual results from the application, um, so I've anonymized this to kind of protect the innocent. Um, this graph here, this uh, I guess reddish, orangish line, whatever it's coming across as, on top is the baseline or previous, um, and the bluish greenish thing um, is uh, is the after. Um, and there's a couple key things to note. The little dashed line in here is the SLA ceiling, um, and it's kind of a fixed SLA type of thing. Uh, the y-axis is response time, the x-axis is user per core, um, and if you measure just where the uh, line ends up hitting the SLA fall, we have roughly 14% better density with these improvements. Um, so from the user perspective, you know, just apply a hypervisor patch and boom, you got 14% better system. And the other thing I like to look at is that the steepness of the ceiling is, is our steepness of the line is quite a bit less. Right, so as we degrade over the SLA fault line, the, the line there is quite a bit less steep. So if you were to compare, uh, let's see, 10 users per core or so uh, with, this, uh, with this setup at the previous rate, you would see the gap in between these be astronomical. Um, so it's, it's quite a bit of um, uh, a better response time and quite frankly, uh, better tail latency is a good way to put it. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, I realized that not everybody has to deal with healthcare applications. So let's talk about this in a bit of a more generic way um, using a benchmark from Login VSI, which is kind of emulating virtual desktops. Um, and same type of load runner type idea. You've got a bunch of VMs that live on a host running Office and, and Windows desktop and, and, and so on. It measures, you know, opening Excel, opening Internet Explorer, doing di oper different operations and measuring response time. Um, we do this also on an Ice Lake based system, and we're comparing here um, our previous release, which is 5.4 based, and our current release is just 5.10 based, um, and taking out uh, hardware acceleration for the IPIs, just because there's some enablement issues there that we'll talk about. Um, 
And we can see here this really awesome graph from Login VSI. I swear I can't change the color scheme on it. Uh, so it's blue and blue. It's just the way it outputs. But the top line, um, which is kind of going up into the ceiling, uh, is the previous release. Um, the red line there is the kind of maximum ceiling for response time. And uh, the bottom line is our current release. So you'll note very cl clearly um, at 320 VMs per host, we don't hit the SLA ceiling at all, meaning that from a customer perspective, you know, if you had 300 something VMs per host, you can get even better experience, better tail latency at full load, which is, which is great. Um, onto these nice uh, colorful graphs, which I can control the colors of, um, we can see that what's called VSI base, which is a measurement of what the lowest single session response time is, um, is uh, quite a bit lower. The percentage there is about 9%. That means that even if you're not fully loaded, these optimizations will give you 9% better user experience, which is awesome. Um, and the other thing we looked at is say, well, you know, let's take away some of the automated ceiling stuff that this benchmark does and use the fix SLA kind of like the EHR benchmark does. So instead of um, having the SLA uh, up at like 1800 milliseconds, we set it at 1200 milliseconds for this response time, this benchmark. And you can see um, the, the difference there quite a bit. Uh, so if we look at that, we can see the benchmark there. If you kind of look at the x-axis, which is active sessions per host, um, you know, it's below 256, this one's far above 256. And the actual numbers there, if you're doing a fixed rate threshold, is you know, 298 sessions, almost 300 sessions with the uh, optimized kernel and 245 sessions for the unoptimized kernel, which is a 22% um, increase in, in response time at a fixed rate, um, which is, is pretty good. All right. um, so zooming out uh, for some related ecosystem enhancements, um, so as I mentioned, it kind of takes a village, right? So in our hypervisor for networking, we run Open vSwitch, um, and there's you know, both Windows, Windows and Linux guests. So I want to talk through some findings and methodologies that we've uh, seen in these guys. Um, and the first one in Open vSwitch is a thundering herd problem. So uh, I try not to read through this. I put this just big dump of detail, um, really more for slide consumers. Um, but the short of it is, um, uh, OVS has a thundering herd wake up problem. Um, and the challenge for CPU sensitive workloads like EHR workloads, but it could be anything like SAP HANA or other database workloads, is that when that thundering herd blasts up, if you have anything in a halt polling loop, one of the exit conditions for KVM halt polling is single task running. So you'd have stuff in your run queue and you could potentially um, have less than ideal polling, which is what we saw. Um, and the issue there is that there was a change back in the day to optimize the wake-up pattern for OVS. It was all well-intentioned and, and good, but it just made it actually go into a thundering herd. Um, we found this in an interesting way, which is using um, Google SCEDVIS. If you've never used Google SCEDVIS, I know there's plenty of Googles or Googlers out here, um, so they may have already used it. Um, but Google SCEDVIS is really, really quite slick. So um, visualizing things like uh, wake-ups and migrations and interactions of this low-level scheduler itself is incredibly hard. If you've ever tried to like F-trace that, you get a massive output and it, it's really difficult to visualize and understand what's doing what. SCEDVIS does all this stuff for you. So we can see in here, we've taken a SCEDVIS trace from a host. The details aren't super important, but what we can uh, see in here is there's a little uh, search command. We search for the handler threads, those are the OVS handler threads. We can visualize them with this little color-coded rainbow doodad on the left. And we see, bang, there's a thundering herd, right? All of these uh, threads are waking up at the exact same time and kicking all of the applications off the cores like that. Um, and that's bad. Now, that is uh, fixable uh, with both a kernel and OVS fix. It's one of these things that has to be done on both sides or it doesn't work. Um, I have the links to the commit series in the previous slide. Uh, but the net of it is a 28 reduction, 28x, 28x reduction in wakeups, which is awesome for latency sensitive workloads. So if you're running the affected kernel in OVS versions, you want to get this patch on board like ASAP. Um, another issue which uh, I uh, upstreamed, it actually just got committed yesterday conveniently, um, is uh, OVS communicates um, over uh, Netlink to the kernel to get some statistics. Uh, and um, actually, excuse me, it communicates over the kernel to Netlink to do all sorts of different things one feature of Netlink is it just automatically gathers all these statistics, which is all well and good. It's all good. But on really big systems, like uh, what you might find for quad socket or eight socket systems for SAP HANA, um, 
There's some of those calls in the kernel are uh, linear in complexity based on the amount of cores. Um, and uh, it's really expensive to the point where the OVS uh, vSwitch daemon just sits on the CPU constantly and sucks away a core. And when you have CPU sensitive applications like EHR or whatever, um, that uh, loss of a core is kind of expensive, especially when you're thinking about it at scale. So there's two key improvements here. One of them is uh, the one we just committed to OVS yesterday. Um, to elide some of the stats gathering, um, reduces CPU and OVSD, or excuse me, um, vSwitchD. Uh, and then there's also a commit to inline some of the uh, expensive uh, stats getting uh, calls, which does help, but it doesn't completely eliminate the issue. So you need, it's another one of those things where you need both to actually kind of whack this on large systems. Um, and in, in true form, I love my flame graphs, and clearly when you take a flame graph, this issue stands out like a sore thumb. You can see that um, OVS's bridge run uh, function here is doing all sorts of whatever. Um, and it's just spending all this time in this uh, inet, fill, link, af, whatever that is, um, getting stats. But the thing is, it's not actually reading any of those stats when the call returns, so it's just completely pure overhead. So we get rid of that with the commits mentioned, and wouldn't you know, a little purple uh, uh, search field here in the flame graph goes down from 4 point two, or excuse me, 42.2 percent of samples to 9.4 percent of samples. Um, so a, a big time tax cut. Um, last two bits here. Um, one of them is Linux Vertio related. Um, this isn't uh, throwing any tomatoes at our friends at Red Hat, but um, prior to Red Hat 7, uh, 8, um, multi-queue didn't actually work for Vertio uh, SCSI, um, where if you had a multi-queue enabled uh, backend, um, it would just funnel everything to one queue. Um, so you can see here, um, we, we use vhost uh, or v, vhost user SCSI at Nutanix um, to do out of tree uh, PCI management. Uh, that process happens to be called Frodo. Frodo is the keeper of the rings, you know, yes. So that's where that comes from. And uh, you can see here in the top trace that uh, you know, very simply uh, one thread is doing all the work. That's ridiculous. So um, we reported that up to Red Hat and thankfully um, it was just a, a simple cherry pick on their side. Um, and so Red Hat 7, 8, and, and what have you, and above, um, now works, uh, works much better, uh, which is great. Um, last bit I have before I get into some of the appendix stuff, if I still have any time, I know I'm, I'm running short on it, um, is a large I.O. in Windows. All right, so uh, this is one subject I'm incredibly passionate about, uh, is that um, one of the benchmarks that our, one of our EHR partners has um, basically goes through and does uh, uh, restore, backup, um, some ETL stuff and, and kind of emulates a database workload. Um, and large IOs in the back of a restore section, this didn't work very well. Um, and we ran into some issues getting that to work um, uh, uh, cleanly and actually have it come across to our storage backend as, as a one mega O instead of like, you know, concatenating 256 KIOs. Um, and the fix there was multifold. There's kind of three different commits. Um, that have taken, taken a whack at making um, large IOs work in the driver, which is great. Um, the last one, which was upstreamed earlier this year, is one that um, we put up there to uh, fix the maximum transfer length handling so we can kind of cleanly get a one meg IO, not like a one meg and 512k IO or something. Um, and the kind of money slide here is this one, right, where uh, the requirement of this application is to be to be able to back up at line speed, and now we can back up at 100 gigs per second out of this application um, with 100 gig, you know, Mellanox, CX6, whatever. Um, and so the benchmark comes, you know, nice, clean, and flat with 512K write restore IOs, and, you know, it's hitting some line limitations there around, you know, a paltry sum of 12 to 13 gigabytes per second, blistering. Um, the last thing I'll bring up here, I know I've just got a minute, um, is that uh, technically this actually breaks the Vernio spec um, because uh, the way that Windows driver works is uses indirect descriptors um, and long story short, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Um, so we've got an, a PR upstream to, to fix that in the Vernio spec and, and we'll, we'll, we'll route that back and, and make it work. But um, I think that's the last of it. So uh, I probably have maybe 30 seconds left if anybody wanted does a, a, a speed round question or, or catch me afterwards. Yes, sir. It's definitely cool that you're finding these and fixing these bugs, but do you have any PI testing so you're actually testing them when they go upstream? Um, 
Yes. So there's a, I don't have the slides in here, but we have a extensive performance CI at Nutanix that looks for these types of things. Yeah. Um, and the EHR, the EHR benchmarks are a part of that. But it's, it's always, it's one of these things where you can look at uh, benchmark results and they might be, look good in hindsight, but they're not necessarily also having a CI across like competitive platforms as well. So yeah, those were those kind of late, late binding things might come in. But the question was, uh, you know, do you have a CI for that? And the answer is yes, we do. Yeah. Well, I think we hit it exactly on the mark. It's 25 minutes. So that's, that's all I got. Yeah. Thanks. Available, but there's appendix slides, has all the details, blah, 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 blah. But you can get those later.